Hi, welcome back to the next video snippet from Zivari, the zombie novel. Uh, we're going to read the first part of chapter 18 today, in which um, Ike and Bibi and the Mercs go out searching for one particular zombie. Mm -hmm. So, if you're ready, we'll begin. Here we go. When Riddick and his search and rescue team, Ike and BB, boarded a nondescript cargo helicopter Wednesday morning, Sergeant Earhart was in the shower. Corporal DeBigney was sitting at her kitchen table drinking an organic green smoothie, and Dr. McDougall had already left for the lab. For the members of the search and rescue team, it was just another job, probably three annoying weeks of what would likely be a fruitless search for that rich asshole's loser kid. For Ike and BB, this was a journey back to the beginning of a nightmare that had taken away their freedom and their futures. This was a chance, and both knew it. It was a slim chance to escape from under Donaldson's corrupt thumb. For Sergeant Earhart, this would be another day of paperwork and meetings and working with a handsome man whose cute little ass she had unwittingly begun to covet. For Corporal DeBigny, this was the first opportunity to create a patrol that was composed of people who should be troopers, people who were troopers even before they joined the patrol. For Dr. McDougall, this was a day that would see the culmination of all of his research and the discovery of the mechanism of zombification and maybe, yes, just maybe the Nobel Prize for medicine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. McDougall decided that he should begin writing his acceptance speech immediately. The helicopter hovered 50 feet above the roof of the post office in Peck, Kansas. Ritter nodded and Oon and Dow fell down to land on the roof, pump and track moved to gear to the door and connected it to the cable attached to the winch and lowered it to the two on the roof. This offloading took 10 minutes. Then tree, pedwar, pump, and chweck rappelled down. Ritter nodded to Ike, who hooked on and rappelled down, and then to Beebe, who did the same, before he joined his men on the roof. By the time Ike and Beebe reached the roof, Ritter's men had almost all of the gear and supplies stowed away. Chweck investigated the shower and the portable chemical toilet and pronounced that both were still functional. Tree and Pump got a pair of M4s, slammed in clips, and popped the hatch off the stairway into the building. They disappeared down the stairs and reappeared five minutes later, giving the high sign that all was copacetic below. While Tree and Pump were checking out the building below, Oon and Dow took up sentry positions at opposite corners of the roof, M4s loaded and in hand. At 1 p.m. or so, Pedwar grabbed a handful of MREs and walked around the roof, tossing the meals to each of the members of the team. What'd you get? B.B. asked. Like, spinach and mushroom fettuccine? Vegetarian. Want to trade? No way. I got brisket. Maybe next time, B.B. said. Okay, be that way, but when you're stuck with it, shit on a shingle, don't come crying to me, Ike told B.B. as he hesitantly put a fork full of the green noodles into his mouth. Hey, this ain't half bad, Ike said a moment later. After lunch, the afternoon dragged on. Ritter had spent the time between when the team had landed on the roof and lunch, mapping out a grid for the search of the town. He motioned his team over to a small collapsible table where he had set up his maps. We'll begin with the area along the railroad. Un Dao, Tree, and Chweck, you will accompany Hayes and Duvalier. Begin along 119th Street, even spacing between North Avenue D and the railroad tracks. Proceed north until you pass the grain elevators, then move east to sweep the area between North Avenue D and North Avenue C, and then sweep back to the post office. I will debrief you when you return. Riddick's four men grabbed their M4s. Chweck clipped a 203 grenade launcher under the barrel of his and grabbed a couple of buckshot rounds just in case, and SIGs and four or five clips of ammo for each. Ike took his rifle and the governor, BB his marlin and his Glock. Which of you two is taking the net gun, Riddick asked. Net gun, BB responded. We want to bring Mr. Donaldson, his son, alive or undead and not just a head in a sack. If Rick's a zombie, we'll take it in the net. Phoebe volunteered and slung the net gun over his shoulder on a sling. They'd get Rick, undead or alive. Un led the squad. Un, Dow, BB, Ike, Tree, and Chweck stretched along in a row from North Avenue D to the tracks. As they walked north, the distance between the men diminished as the tracks moved slightly southwest to northeast. About 30 yards north of 119th Street, Chweck, Tree, and Ike came to a little house with a dilapidated garage behind it. Chweck waited until Tree and Ike were positioned at the back door, and then he kicked in the front door to find an empty room. Tree and Ike came in the back way at the same time and found nothing in the kitchen. The three men cleared the other two rooms of the house, went out the back door, and cleared the empty garage. Twenty feet behind the empty house was a single wide trailer, empty. 
and 20 feet to the left of that, a shed, also empty. As Tree, Ike, and Schweck were cleaning the shed, Undao and Bibi came to a long, narrow warehouse that paralleled the tracks. It was about 15 feet wide and 60 feet long. Dow went in first with Un and Bibi right behind him. First half of the building was empty of zombies, but full of rotting pallets holding rotting crates full of rusting metal parts. The last 30 feet of the warehouse held pallets that once had held containers of produce, which had long since rotted away. The smell hadn't quite. As the two parts of the team of searchers worked their way north, they passed a rusting pickup with two barrels in the bed, leaking some noxious liquid that had eaten its way through the metal, two empty boxcars on a siding, and two more little homes, all vacant and zombie-free. The six main men came upon a complex that consisted of a little office, a machine shop, and lumber storage with saws and lathes ready to work the wood. Again, not a zombie in sight. Twenty-five feet north of that stood four grain elevators with a 20 by 40 building just to their north. They cleared the elevators quickly. When they reached the last building on their sweep north before they would turn and head back to the post office, Dow kicked the door open. It was like turning on the light in a kitchen in a rundown apartment at midnight. But instead of cockroaches skittering away across the counters, behind the refrigerator and under the stove, the undead swarmed out of the darkness. Dow retreated, firing his S1 F M4 on full auto. The undies that were hit in the abdomen or chest kept moving. The ones whose heads were separated from their necks dropped like rocks. Once Dow recovered from his original fright, he and his team took the zombies apart in a cool and methodical methodical manner. Nowhere among this apocalypse of zombies, Bibi wondered about the proper collective noun for zombies. A shawn of zombies, maybe? Was Rick. In fact, while the zombies that staggers out of the building were, wore rotting overalls, dresses, and suits, one even wore a cute little romper, none wore a burgundy silk smoking jacket. Go figure. It took the team 15 minutes of intense gunfire before the team was able to clear the building. It took another 10 minutes for the members of the team to walk among the fallen undead and shoot the still wiggling ones in their heads. After the last of the undead were finally really dead, the team moved east to finish their sweep between North Avenue D and North Avenue C, moving back to the post office. They first came to a good-sized ranch house with an above-ground pool, cracked and empty in the backyard. The six men quickly cleared the house, finding no zombies but a nest of opossums in a back bedroom. The team moved together into the backyard of the ranch house and through a hedge to a much smaller little bungalow. Again, they found nothing of interest. They moved south from the bungalow, kicking over a rickety picket fence to get to the next house. They passed by four good-sized raised bed garden frames that were full of asparagus gone to seed. As they approached the house, three undies staggered around the corner by the garage, unlooked at Ike and Bibi to make sure none of the undead were Rick, and when their shaking heads assured him, he pulled his sig and dropped the three, with shots between their eyebrows, all within two seconds. Un looked at his teammates and smiled, and Dow, Tree, and Chweck all reached into their pockets and each handed him a folded bill. Un shrugged and said to Ike and Bibi, We wanted to make this shitty job interesting. You two want in? Both Ike and Bibi shook their heads. Too rich for my blood and my bank account, Ike told Un. No prob, Bob, Un told him. The six men turned to their right and pushed through a tight line of trees to the last house on North Avenue D, just to the north of the post office. Again, there was a great deal of kicking in of doors, but no zombies to show for it. Before their sweep would be finished, the team had to go back to North Avenue C and clear the last two homes that lay directly east of the post office. The six men cleared the first house and moved to the last one on their list. They went into the house through the back door, checked every room and left by way of the front door. As they walked out, into North Avenue C, Tree pointed to the left, north on the street. Coming toward them from the side of the street that they had not investigated were 30 or maybe 35 undies, shambling and staggering and shuffling, seemingly with one thought in mind. Sig's boys? Dow asked. Riddick's four men slung their M4s over their shoulders and pulled their pistols. Let us know if there's a zombie we shouldn't shoot, Dow said to Ike and Bibi. If it's open season, stand back and let the pros do their work. I was fine with Ike and Bibi. Bibi looked out at the undead moving closer and closer. None of the clothing left on any of the monsters was remotely silk or burgundy. Fire away, boys, Bibi said. The fusillade that began almost instantly was deafening. It lasted 15 seconds, no more. And when Ritterick's men hosted, ho holstered their handguns, there was not a twitch from any of the undead that now littered the street. Damn, Ike whispered. Ritterick's men checked the now still undead. 
all had been dispatched with, a, with single shots to their heads. It was a remarkable exhibition of marksmanship. The team walked quickly back to the post office, the shooters with a spring in their steps, the observers much less buoyant. When the team climbed the stairs to the roof, Riddick's men were received by Riddick and the two goons with congratulations with a great deal of backslapping. Riddick went to a cooler that Ike and Beebe hadn't noticed before and tossed four beers to his four men. Undao, Tree, and Chuek spent the next hour telling tales of their adventure and marksmanship. Then Riddick announced dinner and distributed the MREs for the evening. Ike got beef stew and Beebe got ravioli. Neither man thought about anything but getting something to eat and going to sleep. It had been a long day and tomorrow would probably be longer. Riddick's men stood four-hour watches, two on the opposite corners of the building. The night was clear and the moon was almost full, so there was no need for night vision. 